Oha Yadin Di Baha is one of the organizers for Charleston Black Lives Matter. And in this special edition of Quentin's Close-Ups, I sit down exclusively with him one-on-one. Oha -on -one. Yadin. Hello. Uh, it's been a while since I've actually seen you. Mm. I see you around here at the College of Charleston a lot. And you know, the first time I actually met you was when I interviewed Faith and Santana back in May. Mm -hmm. Uh, a lot of people don't know about who you are. So as we sit here right now, who is Muha Yadin Di Baha? Ah, Muha Yadin Di Baha. So I moved down from New York when I was 13. Okay. And so I moved out to Hollywood Adams Run. So the Grampus family out there at the end yeah. of Grampus Hill Road, yeah. that's my roots down here. And so coming back, uh, I'm, a, I'm a person on a journey to actually reclaim my roots. And so uh, when I got back here from uh, after college and bouncing around the, the country doing organizing different spaces and places I realized that my home my roots needed a lot of nourishment and so uh, I came back with a plan that was called building from the block up uh, but people were dying cops were just shooting people there was a nation that was burning and so in Charleston we didn't have a voice for that and so I decided to start Black Lives Matter Charleston along with like three or four other folks that said if this happens in Charleston we're going to be ready for it and so in November we had a big march um, for Eric Gardner's indictment and then afterwards we kind of got our organization set up so uh, we would be able to respond. Walter Scott happened we were able to respond. And speaking of which as you know an article came out in the Charleston City paper on August 17th where it basically said that and I don't know if this is true but North Charleston Police Department and other law enforcement agencies were, I guess, surveilling or surveying you guys or watching you guys on the video cameras. Tell me how so. Most definitely. And so right after Walter Scott, right, so we, we got the video from Fed and Santana. He let us know what was going on. And so we were able to start, you know, calling shots and, and, and pulling things together before uh, the police department even knew what was going on. Okay. Um, so that concerned them. Uh, so as soon as we started doing things like protesting, uh, like blocking traffic, like causing ruckus, I'm, I'm sure they were interested in who these people are. Not only to mention that, we had people from the Black Lives Matter movement nationally really coming down to support us and, and, and show us love. And so in Charleston, when there's, a, when there's Africans uh, being less than respectable, I'm sure that causes the structure to, to get a little uh, ruffled. And so they came into our meetings, whoever they were, with cameras blazing, making sure they got pictures of everyone um, without introducing themselves, like who they were and what they were about. Uh, they had cameras outside, uh, they had police cars outside of our meetings and whatnot, and so it's, they were present, they were present. And when I read that article, to be fair, mm -hmm. uh, Spencer Pride, the press release, yeah. well, press secretary for North Charleston Police basically said it wasn't the North Charleston Police Department, mm -hmm. but it was sled in American Red Cross. Mm. Well, what does the Red Cross have to do with surveillance? That's the question. I have nothing to do with that. I'm just a journalist, you know, asking this question. But when you saw those cameras there, what makes what? Where were you emotionally? Well, we were. We didn't care. You know, we were at a point where it's like we were gonna make sure that there was justice, making sure that Michael Slager was indicted and arrested as soon as possible, and making sure that we got our policy points, our demands for a citizen review board heard uh, by the nation. And so we accomplished our objective. Um, unfortunately, we didn't build out the organization the way that we needed to because there was counter pressure, such as infiltration happening within the organization. And speaking of which, when I interviewed Mayor Keith Sumney on last week, Wednesday, he basically said that you guys were not too amicable when you wanted to meet with him. You came in with a lot of demands, and he feels like he can sit down with someone in a rational manner. Uh, tell me this, if you have the opportunity to meet, to meet with Mayor Sumney again, what would you like to talk to him about next? For sure. And so it's the same exact thing we started talking about, community oversight over the police force. And so to have people walking around with guns that the community doesn't trust, that should not be. The trust and, le and legitimacy of the officers has been broken. And so now we need a spaces and places to heal that trust, a way that the community can actually hold these officers accountable for their actions and the way that they move and what they do. I would tell Keith Sumney again, your time is up. As you know, there's re-election coming up for his uh, particular seat as mayor. He's running along with um, 
Clifford Smith, as well as now Reverend Chris Collins. So tell me this, what do you want to hear from next from those candidates? Well, you left out John Singletary. That's right. And so John Singletary has been talking a lot about um, equality and equity and actually bringing back a sense of fairness within the North Charleston government. So I want to hear something more passionate from these candidates about the state and the situation that Summy has allowed to happen, the disparities in North Charleston for 20 years. There's no way that somebody can uh, allocate funds, all, our, all of our tax money, into one community, into one kind of business, for one kind of people. That's white supremacy. He's practicing white supremacy, and if any candidates don't speak to that, then they're not telling now, the truth. Now, memory lane to June 17th. Mm. I was at home when I got the news about nine people who were shot at Mother Emanuel, and obviously we know what took place thereafter. Um, the unity came together, and I understand that, you know, the family actually forgave Dylan Roof. Tell me, as we're sitting right now, how much do you guys, really, meaning Black Lives Matter, do you guys really forgive him as well? Well, there's no forgiveness without reconciliation. And so that night, my heart was broken, right. the community's heart was broken. Right. Again, we experienced terrorism, state-sponsored terrorism, white supremacist terrorism, random people that are holding ideologies that the same statue of John C. Calhoun actually put forth. These are things living in our midst right now. Reconciliation would be actually eliminating some of those barriers, those policies, those memorials, those politicians that continue to condone white supremacy by their omission are their direct willful neglect of the black community. So there's no forgiveness that happens without reconciliation. There's a sense of, uh, I need to, 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 to get through with this and I need to cope through this, but until I know that you're not gonna hurt me anymore, how would I look keep on on forgiving you? That would be silly of me to keep on forgiving you. Okay. This is what we've been doing. Let's talk about the Confederate flag. As you know, you were in Columbia during that mm -hmm. particular time, and it was a very historic moment for many people here in South Carolina. When you saw the flag come down, tell me where were your heart and mind? Thinking that that's not enough. That's a symbol. Symbols are important, but the symbols represent things. I want to talk about the substance. I want to talk about the substance of the legislature that was fighting that flag coming down. Again, we talk about cycles of oppression, but we never talk about the cycles of privilege that maintain that oppression. So the flag is, is, is a, again, a symbol. Let's talk about the substantial changes that need to happen for equity to exist for once in South Carolina. Which are? We need affordable care. We need to have oversight over the police forces. We need to have the ability to actually put our grievances to circuit court judges and appellate judges that actually care and will deliver justice for us. We need to have some economic equality. We need to stop being gentrified off of the land and the islands that we have, that we've worked, that we've built, just because some developers decide that it's worth more and we're not using it to the best of their standards. These are things that anybody that, that cares about this community, that anybody cares about the longevity of, of the Gullah Geechee heritage and traditions and preserving what is here would be fighting for. Clement the Pinckney was fighting for this. These are things that we had a warrior that had 20 something years in the legislature. We can't buy that back. A flag coming down doesn't buy that back. Millions of dollars doesn't buy that back. He could have been the governor of the state. We don't set up people to do those kinds of things and allow them to be assassinated without feeling some kind of way. Describe to me the following one word, the Michael Brown moment of silence. Silent. Describe to me that in one word. That happened just a few days ago. Silent. Uh, the Garvey Day. That was jubilant. Uh, Charleston's Day of Grace coming up. Strategic. Zachary Hammond. Tragic. Black Lives Matter. Revolutionary. Muha Yadim Dabu Di Baha. Sacred. Well, Muha Yadim Diha Baha, thank you so much for your time. For sure. I appreciate this. No problem. Thank you.